What's up, everybody? Welcome inside the MRN studios for another edition of NASCAR Coast to Coast, brought to you by Wheelan Engineering, manufactured in America for over 70 years. Wheelan Engineering, we got another special episode this week. Kyle Ricky decided to go jet off to Bristol and cover the Arkham Menard Series and NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series for MRN. So that means we get to welcome back Mr. Rob Blount, content creator at Flow Racing, who knows all things NASCAR Regional, because that is your primary <laughs> gig. And boy, you've been crisscrossing uh, the great part of the region here the last several weeks getting to follow along at whether it's cars tour or smart modifieds or you name it you've been there so how has the last few weeks been for you we're starting to wind down the season i guess we've got championships to talk about here coming up we really do just a handful of honestly you can't even say handful it's less than a handful of races <laughs> left in just about every series in the southeast and uh all the points battles are a lot of yes. fun. So it's been a lot of fun to be at all of them. But uh, I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me back on. Anytime I get to be here, I'm having a great day. Oh, yeah. Well, good. I'm glad we can do that. And we're <laughs> happy to have you for sure. And we've got a busy show as well. We've got Matt Tiff joining us on the show, of course, making his return to pavement racing. Of course, a former NASCAR Cup Series driver will kind of be like a where are you at now segment. Of course, all that th he's had to battle. And then, of course, he had some drama coming up this past weekend. So we'll dive into that. Obviously, Connor Zilich, we were just talking about it before the show started. What more can you say about this young 18-year-old? Continues to win and now is going to really turn some heads here as we get ready to uh, see what he can do the rest of the season in the NASCAR Xfinity Series before going full-time next year. By the way, he's going to run for an ARCA East title coming up on Thursday. And we get set for this weekend and, of course, more tracks honoring or uh, crowning champions. And, of course, we'll break down the points battles in some of our top series. But let's start last week and the Arkham Menard Series out at the Watkins Glen International Road Course. Got to be there for MRN up in the turn in the inner loop. And one thing was pretty stagnant the whole night is nobody could touch Connor Zilich. <laughs> yeah, you, you touched on it, right? What more can you say other than this kid just won an arc race by 12 seconds over yeah. the whole field? He had like Washington. a 17-second lead before the break, too. This absolutely incredible performance. And then he goes out there the next day in the Xfinity Series and shows that Friday was no fluke and starts on the pole and wins his first Xfinity race. So, I mean, the, the kid's just absolutely on fire right now. What and as somebody who's followed you know short track racing and, and especially on the cars tour to go from little to no experience maybe you have a couple cars tour starts obviously Connor won earlier this uh, earlier this year at Hickory but that transition I think people really don't realize how difficult it is to go, go in an Xfinity car for the first time. Yeah, it's on a road course. That's kind of his wheelhouse, but that field was loaded. I mean, you had William Byron, you had Brandon. J I mean, you had several. Road course ringers I mean SVG was in the field. I mean, that's got to be a difficult task. So I think people obviously knew how good he is, but that cemented the fact that this kid is the real deal. Yeah, that proved especially on the road course just how strong he is. I mean, you mess mentioned Shane Van Gisbergen. and he comes to Chicago and makes everybody look silly on yeah. the street course at Chicago a year ago. I think he's already up to three Xfinity wins this season all on road courses. And then there's Connor Zillish and his first Xfinity start winning the pole by almost a full second on the field. I mean, the kid is just so darn strong. It's absolutely crazy. And it was a lot of fun when we were able to stay green there late at the end of the race, <laughs> yeah. watching him versus Shane Van Gisbergen. And that was a really fun battle to watch. For sure. And then, of course, on Friday night with his Arkham Menard Series win, of course, his fifth win in six national starts. So we'll see if he can uh, continue that strength coming up on Thursday night at Bristol. Brandon Jones was in the field for that Arca race, finishing third. So a good kind of tune-up for him. Although he didn't have the day. I know he probably wanted at Watkins Glen on the Xfinity side, but got valuable track time in that race as well. Uh, and, and, of course, you know we mentioned what Connor did on Saturday in the Xfinity. Infinity series. Now, when you look at the Arc Menard series, and we'll talk a little bit about it in segment three at Bristol, I think we're poised now to officially have a full season without a national, a regular national series competitor going to victory lane. Andres Perez has been close so many times, 54 point lead, but I mean, I don't know. When you look at Bristol, you look at Toledo, I mean, do we have another shot at maybe one of those regulars getting it, or is this going to be a Connor versus Williams show for the rest of the year? I think that's exactly what we're looking at. And I, I, I was interesting when I was doing my notes to prepare for this is I, I found something that, that really blew my mind. Yeah. Neither one of them has run every single ARCA National Series race. But in the races that they have run together, which is 18 total, they have won a combined 83.33% of the Arca Menard Series races. That's just wow. William Sawalich and Connor Zillich. That is absolutely incredible what the two of them have done uh, on the east side 
and on the Ark of Menard series side. Yeah, no joke. That stat definitely jumps out on the page for sure. So we'll talk about Bristol coming up. Of course, that is a combo event with the Arca East champion being crowned that weekend as well. Uh, back to your neck of the woods, Cars Tour, Z-Max Cars Tour, late model stocks and pro late models were out at Sobo, South Boston Speedway. We've got, what, three events left in the 2024 season. and Two events two, left. Well, two events two now. now. Going into last week was three, and, and the championship continues to get tighter. I mean, what do you expect now after what was a great race in South Boston where we had a pretty tight uh, battle for the lead there near the end? Yeah, that was a really fun race in South Boston that Carson Koppel got the advantage on on a late restart there over Ryan Millington and went out and took his third win of the year. But, man, these last two races... Connor Hall versus Brendan Butterbean Queen. If if you've been to Langley Speedway a lot, you know that that is the longstanding rivalry, <laughs> uh, which has been brought over to the Cars Tour side, and that's now what we get on the championship battle. And it's just one point separating the two of them going to Tri County in a couple of weeks, and then we'll see what it looks like after that when they go to North Wilkesboro of all places to crown their champion, which is going to be a lot of fun. But I tell you what, if I'm Connor Hall, I'm a little bit worried. Yeah. Brennan Queen has won the last two races at Tri-County, leading every single lap in both of those races. So I think it's a total of 250 laps. And he won last May's race at North Wilkesboro yep. and led the most laps in this August race at North Wilkesboro. And the only reason that he lost that race that I think is they had a little bit of a mistake on the crew side on the preparation of the car. They put the right rear shock on the left rear, left rear shock on the right rear, and discovered it at the halfway break. And at this point, he had already dominated everything, and the handling just continued to go away as sure. the race went on. And if you're running that strong with that sort of mistake, no kidding. watch out when the car is right. Wow. So, heads up to Connor Hall. Going to have to be on his A game for sure. Um, shout out to Delane Riggs, who was in the field, finished in the top five. Of course, you mentioned Brendan, Brendan Butterbean Queen, of course, in that championship hunt, uh, getting in the top five as well. Ryan Millington, of course, we saw him win at, at Florence. Unfortunate timing, because I bet you if that yellow doesn't come out, you think he's going to win? Uh, I think so, but man, that eight car, Carson Quapel yeah. is coming on really strong there. But you know, it's interesting. They run the choose rule now after, I think they've been doing it since the second race of last season. Uh, and if, if that hadn't been a thing, Carson Quapel restarts third, but now he restarts on the inside of the front row and got a great restart center off in the turn one, man. That was the deepest anybody had driven off into there all <laughs> night long and it worked for him, but I don't know. Um, yeah, you might be right. I think Ryan probably would have held on and won his second race in a row, but it was definitely going to be a, a show there to the end. For sure. And Carson, of course, getting his third win of the season on the pro late model side of things. Spencer Davis doing Spencer Davis things lately. He has been strong, including, you know, last time out before South Boston at, at uh, Florence when I got to be there in person to watch him drive from the mid pack up to the lead, too, as well. What's been clicking for them, do you think? And, uh, and then, of course, that championship battle's getting tight, too. Well, it, I will say this. It was getting tight was. before he went out and won two races in a row. I think it was a, a three-point swing on, on that side as well going into South Boston, and now it's 11. Uh, Caden Honeycutt, I think, finished third or fifth on Saturday at South Boston. But, um, man, they, they have... They've been strong all year, Spencer Davis and in his 2019 have. They just hadn't been able to get the win. They got it at Florence, and we all talk about just how snowballs. momentum is a thing in <laughs> racing, right? Got that win finally. And I mean, you look at Ryan Millington, finally got that win on the late model stock side of Florence, yeah. goes out and dominates most of the race, loses it on a late restart. Spencer didn't have that late restart to really worry about, and he was able to just drive away. Uh, but he did have to battle Tristan McKee on the, the last restart of the race. It wasn't super late, but... That's another person to watch out for. I think he's like 15, 16 years old at that point. At this point, and Tristan McKee went out and dominated at North Wilkesboro in August, and he's going to be one to watch for. And it's crazy. Tristan McKee runs Millbridge uh, Micros up at Millbridge every Wednesday night, and I see him, and you just keep forgetting that you know he's a Cars Tour winner in the Pro Late models and has a real shot to kind of make things interesting. So we've got a couple weeks off. October 14th, Tri County Speedway. Kind of wish it was this weekend, just with all the momentum that the Cars Tours had, but we're going to have to wait a little bit, so we'll talk about that when that time comes. Uh, final thing, kind of big thing going on this past weekend was the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour. The Ground Pounders back in action, and of course, that championship is going to go down to the wire as well between Ron Silk, Justin Bonsignor, but Ron Silk doing things at Riverhead this past weekend that he's used to doing, his fourth win of the year, and of course, uh, but it, first time since May, so... 
Ron Silk finally is like, thank goodness I got back in victory lane because Justin was slowly chipping away at things. But what were your thoughts about Riverhead? One of my favorite racetracks to watch the tour race at every year. I love that. Uh, it's that it's one of your favorite places. That's my home racetrack yep. where I got my Why well, I said that just um, for you. <laughs> thank you, Chris. I will say it is really weird seeing them pitting on the inside of that yeah. racetrack there. I know that this is the third year in a row that they've done that in this particular race, but that will never not look weird to me. Uh, used to just seeing that infield wide open. But um, that rivalry, so to say, has been coming to a head really for the last year and a half. Uh, it almost did in this exact race a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it finally did on that last restart with about 15 laps to go on Saturday night with uh, Ron and Justin making a little bit of contact and it breaking the left front on Justin's car, and he limps to a 15th place finish. Not what he needed and definitely not what he expects at a place where he is tied for the most wins in NASCAR Wheel of Modified Tour history there. Um, but you know, for a place that Ron Silk struggled at for a long time, he's certainly figured it out over the last few years. And it's not necessarily a shoe in that Justin's going to go out and win there anymore, as Ron showed uh, the last two races now, as he just swept the year at Riverhead. It's just crazy to me that we may talk about at the end of the season when we wave the checkered flag at Martinsville that maybe that contact could be the turning point in the championship. Obviously, things are still tight when you look at it. It's five points for Ron Silk ahead of Justin Bonsier, so by no means is it over, but every point matters. And when you look at a 15th place finish at Riverhead versus a win, that could be maybe the difference if these two are lockstep down the stretch going to the championship. So it'll see, be interesting to see what happens, but of course we go to the Winchester Fair presented by U.S. S.N.E. at Monadnock Speedway coming up on Saturday in Monadnock. Another great one. Hopefully Kyle Ricky can get us some boots on the ground there this weekend and uh, go uh, watch Ron Silk, Justin Bonsignor, and of course everybody else because it's going to be a stacked field for sure in the final leg of the Wheeling Granite State Short Track Cup. Uh, some other winners I had circled, and, and you can maybe chime in with some of yours from the weekend. Of course, Luke Baldwin on the Smart Modified Tour uh, getting the win at Dominion. Landon Pembleton crowned the late model stock track champion there, so really congr congratulations to him. Uh, Barry Audi put on a cap on another uh, P Pennsylvania Pennsylvania short track championship at Jennerstown Speedway. Michael Bumgarner at Hickory, of course, winning late mile stock. I was a little shocked this year. I want to get your input, too. The, tra the car counts at Hickory this year, not what I expected. Do you feel like this was maybe... I guess in reaction to some of the rules and some of the things and some of the drama we had late last year, earlier this year, and maybe we can get that back up. But it was a little shocked to see that it wasn't where it's usually been. I think it's a combo of that. And honestly, just since we've come out of the pandemic, it's now, what, four years ago, really three years since we've really come back out of it and have started racing. Prices for everything have just been so high, especially on the yeah. tires side. And uh, I think it's a combo of that because it's not just at, at Hickory. You look at South Boston, too. South Boston was the place that the last few years, the NASCAR Weekly Series National Championship has gone through South Boston. Yeah. And this year, they weren't getting full car counts for their weekly shows, most of them at least, uh, especially in the early start of the season uh, as well. So I don't know if it's just some of those issues that we saw some of last year with the rules and stuff. I don't think it's just an isolated thing at Hickory. It seems to be a bit across the board. Interesting stuff. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens there for sure. Casey Roderick also getting the Glass City 200 win for the ASA Stars National Tour, and that is where we're going to talk to our guest this week, Matt Tift. Anybody I miss uh, around the world from uh, NASCAR Regional Racing? Not that I can think so, Chris. I think you did a pretty solid job of recapping it. It's my goal. There. I try to, I try, you know, if we if we miss you, we apologize, but there is so much going There's on, of going course, on. this time of year, too, with everything wrapping up. But let's get to our guest this week. He's standing by on the phone. We'll take a quick break. That is Matt Tift, of course, making his return to pavement late Model racing at the Glass City 200, filled with drama. But we'll of course catch up with him and talk about what he's been up to and uh, maybe his future plans coming up in 2025. That's all coming up next here on NASCAR Coast to Coast, brought to you by Whelan Engineering. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights, white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and warning systems for the automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Whelan products are designed, sourced, and manufactured in America and tested on site to meet the toughest industry standards. Whelan Engineering, manufactured in America for over 70 years. We never left, and we're here to stay.
Welcome back to NASCAR Coast to Coast, brought to you by Whelan Engineering, manufactured in America for over 70 years. Whelan Engineering. Joining us now on the phone, Mr. Matt Tift, of course, former NASCAR Cup Series and Xfinity Series competitor. He drove the number 57 Blaster Super Late Model for Anthony Campy, Anthony Campy Racing this past weekend at Toledo for the Glass City 200. Matt, I don't know where to begin. First of all, welcome back to Pavement Late Model Racing. I guess before we get to what happened this weekend... How was it just being back behind the wheel of a Super and, and getting to enjoy that opportunity? Not only that, but getting to run for Anthony Campy. Yeah, no, it was awesome. Um, it's kind of a deal that got uh, put together really like, uh, I don't even know if it was a week before the race happened. Um, yeah, to be honest, I really had no um, plans at all to run any asphalt Super Late Model stuff uh, this year. And I've been doing a lot of uh, dirt late model racing, some uh, Trans Am races, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, kind of just uh, talk with Anthony. Um, I'd known him for, for um, a while back from the New Smyrna days. We raced against each other, and uh, he's got great stuff, um, great equipment, great cars, and great people with him. So I thought, what the heck, i got a uh, relatively free weekend. Let's um, go try it out. So we um, tested down at uh, Cordell uh, in uh, Georgia and got about 30 laps until the rains came there. So really didn't get much time. Um, but, yeah, once we got to the weekend, um, it was a lot of fun. I um, thought we had really, really good long run speed. Uh, we were one of the fastest cars uh, as far as tire fall off and where we could maintain. I just couldn't bust off a good lap um, in the qualifying trim. and. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes when that happens, uh, you get yourself stuck back in trouble, um, as I found myself in. But, um, yeah, I think I started 14th, and I had driven up to about, I think it was passing for uh, ninth when we kind of got into trouble. And that was about 45 laps in, um, but we had a lot of the field backing up to us, and um, my teammate Casey Roddick went on to win the race. I bet I could have probably finished um, with normal circumstances, probably third, fourth, something like that, but um, was pulling off a lot of passes and stuff and um, kind of made it feel like old times a little bit. So um, it was definitely fun while it lasted. Certainly uh, in a weekend where you weren't necessarily going into it, expecting to go pavement super late model racing, uh, had quite the bit of a weekend. But now that you've done it, what do you think your plans are moving forward? Are we going to see you in more pavement super late model races throughout the year? Are you going to go back to the dirt late model side? So this weekend, I'll go back to the dirt side. Um, I'm racing Friday and Saturday at uh, Erie Speedway in Pennsylvania. I don't think there'll be anything else this year uh, as far as the um, super late model racing. Uh, I've got a, an opportunity to potentially go try out an outlaw car um, on, on asphalt. But, um, you know, that's pr I live up in Cleveland, Ohio, and those are pretty popular around here. Um, we don't really have that much um, super late model racing up my way. It's, it's pretty much um, dirt racing and then, you know, those outlaw cars, uh, the template late models. So, um, you know, to put together a super deal, um, you really got to kind of commit to um, a series, whether that's like ASA or CRA, to go uh, travel to those events and, and kind of do it more. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk to Anthony more uh, this next week and, and see what some plans are for next year. Um, I'm kind of setting, you know, my budget uh, sponsor um, situations and stuff are happening over these next two weeks. So, That'll kind of determine. It. I'd love to go back and do it again. Um, I had a lot of um, a lot of fun running up with Dan Fredrickson uh, last year, and you know Anthony Camping this year. So um, I like doing it. Um, to be completely honest, they're pretty expensive, um, and it just uh, it takes a lot of resources and time to go um, to go run those cars. Even though I like doing it, you know um, they're just uh, they're pricey. They're not NASCAR pricey, but they're definitely more than dirt racing as far as you know committing to a dollar figure to go. Uh, run those cars 100 percent. i mean even if you just look at the tire bills every weekend like holy cow it's incredible <laughs> what the, these uh, teams do week in and week out but hey before we put this past weekend in the rear view obviously the video on social media has been floating around and the reactions to it of what happened uh, obviously getting it into it with billy van meter's crew after after the contact on lap 47 that puts you back into 20th position at the finish um walk us through i guess from your perspective one, what happened, and two, just how do you move on from something like that? And obviously, we've seen the apology that they put out on social media, but um, obviously a tough situation, and, and you don't want to see that, especially at a racetrack. But one, glad you're right, but I guess walk us through what, what happened from your perspective. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, well, first off, I mean, what 
what started the whole thing was I was um, I, I was racing um, again ninth to tenth somewhere around there, uh, lap forty seven, and, and just got taken out. And um, to be honest, I was mad, but uh, I was trapped in the infield for an hour and a half because um, you know, we had like two or three red flags that race. So sure. just stuck in the infield for a long time, and. Um, yeah, I was just kind of looking forward to going home. And then um, I watched uh, uh, the same guy take out two or three more cars. And um, I don't know. Uh, you know, for me, one of the things that, that bugs me about asphalt super late model racing is there's, again, a lot of money involved in it. But there's also a lot of guys who really put a lot of effort. And, you know, for myself, putting my own money into going to do these races and taking on the risk and you just watch some – uh, some kid take out a bunch of cars who has a reputation of doing that. It, it, it pissed me off. So, um, yeah, I went over there, uh, you know, kind of expecting, um, a confrontation and probably a, a scuffle. And, you know, I, I went over there and, uh, said what I said, you know, uh, on the video there. And, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I get turned the ground. That's all good. I don't care. Uh, that's, that's fine. I, I started it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm on the ground and the fight's over. I mean, um, the, the, the post that got uh, sent onto social is a little bit, uh, quicker clip on there. Um, but in, in the real clip, um, the guy, Brian Glaze, who's standing there, he stands there for a good 10, 15 seconds just watching the fight. He claimed in the apology that, uh, he thought his, um, you know, that Billy was knocked out. Billy's walking right next to him. I mean, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing that's going on that would ever, um, show that Billy's knocked out. I mean, I didn't, I didn't punch him. So, um, you know, I gave him a little shove, but I mean, nothing, nothing crazy. And, um, so yeah, he, he claims that he thought he was knocked out and he basically is just, um, sitting there with me on the ground and I'm down there for a good 10, 15 seconds. Everything's done. I had already said, you know, all right, all right. I think it's Billy's dad. He's on top of me again. No problem with that. And, um, yeah, he just winds it up like an NFL kickoff and, uh, right to my face. Hey, what the fuck? Hey, 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 hey. Oh, nope, I got him. I got him. Get out of here. Get out of here. You came to the wrong place. You came to the wrong place. All right, all right, all right, all right. No, all right. No. Hey, I've got something. No, 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 I've got something. Hey, whoever he is, that fucking just got me killed. Whoever he is, he just picked me too. This guy. Yo, I'm good. Hey, call the apple. Just don't, just don't take everybody out, man. I'm looking forward to my pizza that I got from Pizza Hut a couple minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, just wanted to go give him a little piece of my, <laughs> my mind. So I was lucky that uh, it wasn't my my nose or my eye or my mouth that he got. Luckily, it was just my my cheek there. But um, yeah, so I'm fine. Um, but yeah, just uh, just you know, there's there's a line. When it comes to post-race altercations, and I've been in a few of them, we certainly watch a lot of them, whether it's on Sunday or local short tracks um, that go on. And I think there's a general code. I think it's okay to go confront people. I think it's okay to be confronted. I think there's fine. Um, there's a line that's okay. I mean, it's a contact sport, and those things happen. But um, you know, there's certainly a level to where um, you know it, it, there's a line that got crossed, and um, you know, drop kicking anybody. On the ground is is uh, you know after they're already down in a fight to done with uh, that's that's pretty poor and um, unfortunately he does have a record of doing things like that uh, got a pretty bad criminal rap and stuff with it so uh, I definitely applaud the um, ASA uh, Stars Tour for indefinitely um, you know suspending him um, you know I, I said in my video there too you got a lot of 13 through 17 year olds coming up through that series and, and, and somebody like that um, does not need to be around those kids and people that are aspiring to be drivers. And um, yeah, so I applaud uh, their decision there. I also, you know, accept the penalty for myself for uh, going over to, 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 to um, you know, to go start some stuff. That's, that's on me. And um, I understand it. But again, like I said, uh, I, he wrecked a ton of cars and um, you know, I've been a car owner, I've been a driver and uh, it, it just, you know, the, the way that was going about and the reputation around that guy, 
um, I felt like somebody should say, go, you know, say something to him. Yeah, one hundred percent. I and I appreciate you telling us the story because you're right. I mean, at some point, as as a dirt racer former myself, we've all been in a little scuffle at the short track. I mean, that that's what makes short track racing what it is, right? The passion. You're 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 you know you're defending your stuff. You're 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 just showing your displeasure, but certainly there is a line. And we're one glad you're okay because yeah. I saw the video afterwards that you posted. I said. Ooh, man, that does not look good. You got a little shiner there and some cuts and scrapes, but we're glad you're all right. Yeah, no, I, um, again, very lucky um, where he did uh, connect there was, um, uh, was luckily in the uh, soft tissue area of yeah. my cheek, so that, uh, that worked out well. I felt bad, though, because um, there's an official on top of me who, um, who was, you know, trying to break up everything, the guy in the black shirt when you're watching the video. And uh, in the follow through, he got uh, kicked in the face too. So yeah, he um, kicked myself <laughs> oh, and yeah. the official. So uh, yeah, I, I honestly I felt more bad for the official than I did, you know, sorry for myself there. Wow. I, I will say, Chris, you, you mentioned like there's this. It's brutal to to watch, but yeah. I think this is the first time that I've ever actually seen him. And Matt, again, to echo what Chris said, I'm glad you're okay. But I think this is the first time I've ever heard someone get kicked in the face while mic'd up before. Yeah, that's and, the other thing too, like the sound. Yeah, it's not something I, I think no. I need to hear again. I'm sure not something that Matt needs to experience again there. Um, but Matt, we're, yeah, we're no, glad you're doing okay there. It's funny. Yeah, it's funny because like um, people have been like, "Why was he mic'd up? Like, what was this?" Um, and the reality was, um, so my videographer and I, after every race, we always film a post-race little interview just because we cut things up for social later on. Sure. We made a big effort to, you know, to go get um, some. Uh, stuff for our sponsors online and, and try to get, you know, a larger brand and following there. So we always do a little um, little post-race follow-up, whether we use that or not, you know, uh, it, it remains to be seen on the weekend. But um, so we, we cut that. And then I saw, you know, that the race was ending and um, I, I just walked over and, um, you know, I guess Jesse decided to go follow me with the camera and I didn't even know. Um, so, yeah, that's why I was mic'd up because people have been asking, like, why were you mic'd up? That was probably three minutes before, um, but yeah, that just this happened later. But yeah, hearing the kick later on, the funny thing was like I was down, and I thought I got punched or something. I didn't know what hit me, but yeah, later on I was like, oh, okay, that that makes a whole lot more sense. Well, I got lines in my face because that was you know the shoe print. Well, size fourteen or whatever that was, yikes! Uh, but again, glad you're okay and glad we can move on from that. Hey, before we let you go, for maybe folks that may not remember. Uh, you were once in the NASCAR National Series running Cup Series and Xfinity stuff. And we kind of like to do a where are they at now or kind of what the journey's been like. And I know you have been through so much because I think folks uh, sometimes forget that, you know, you were racing at the top levels when you had to step out of the car in Martinsville in 2019. And, of course, you have been an owner as well, part owner on the NASCAR side. What have the last four or five years been like for you as you have gone through all that you've gone through medically, but also at the same time trying to figure out what's next in, in your motorsports career? Yeah. Um, you know, to, to save the time for your show here, uh, if you're curious on the medical side, what happened, just do a, a quick Google search. And well, right now you might find the fight video, but if you go back, <laughs> you, you'll see the, you, you'll see my extensive history there. But, um, yeah. So, uh, after, um, you know, owning with Best motorsports, um, we sold the charter uh, at the end of last year, and um, I decided to part ways from the team uh, and kind of go do my own thing. So I wanted to get back to some racing. Uh, I did one uh, late model race weekend there last year in 2023, and, um, you know, kind of uh, – took um, you know, some, some of our partnerships um, to still run in NASCAR with uh, PB Blaster and, and Gunt there, the you know, same company there, and um, run their motorsports marketing side. And um, I just wanted to go, you know, have some fun and try to uh, racing out. So I've done some uh, historic um, NASCAR stuff. I'll be running the NASCAR Classic Race. Um, it was the HSR series, but the NASCAR Classic Race here at the Robo uh, in a few weeks. But, yeah, doing a lot of dirt late model stuff, uh, you know, an occasional – uh, pavement late model race, did some uh, Trans Am races, but, you know, really kind of having some fun um, at the grassroots levels. And, um, you know, I get asked all the time, you know, will I come back to NASCAR? I don't know um, if I do. It'd probably be a few years from now, but uh, just kind of seeing, you know, where life takes me. I've uh, got a um, you know new baby at home, uh, so taking care of him and having fun with that. I moved from Charlotte. I was down there for 10 years, moved back up to my hometown in Cleveland, Ohio. So, yeah, just... Uh, kind of enjoying going the track um, when I can and um, yeah, run about a schedule of 30 to, to 40 races a year right now on the local levels. With everything that you went through over the last handful of years, 
I know this is kind of like a cliche question, but how good did it feel to get back behind the wheel of a race car that first time out? Oh, yeah, we did a, did a test at Hickory last summer, and um, I fired up the car coming out of the pits um, on the front straightaway, and um, I'm pretty sure I, I missed my march terribly the first two laps because I just couldn't stop smiling in the car. Uh, it was so much fun, and um, just a feeling I didn't know that I would have again. Uh, I pretty much wrote off that ever happening, um, and, you know, that was uh, – something i just i just never felt like was going to happen again so to actually get to do it um you know was was pretty special and um you know to be honest with you i think i think that's hurt my performance a little bit because every time i go to the track i'm having so much fun i just love going to the track i love being in the race car it's been hard for me to be like okay Matt, come on, we're in competitor mode like get that get that fire back when i'm like i'm just loving this you know so um i i think that's uh probably been a little bit of a, a a worse deal for my my finishing and running position sometimes but um i'm certainly appreciating you know going out there every every single weekend and, and competing and having fun well matt we hope to see you do much much more of that whether it's this year or in the 2025 and beyond and uh congratulations on on doing that and getting back behind the wheel and of course we wish you the best of luck and hopefully uh catch up with you more down the road man you've been through a lot and i know you're uh you're still digging and we'll, we'll see you at the track here soon hopefully yeah hopefully we're uh we're talking about some more positive things um than a, <laughs> than a fight because that's not typically my my mo there but uh, i appreciate you guys having me on and um yeah, looking forward to the rest of uh, this race season and what's left of it. Absolutely. Matt Tift, our guest this week. Appreciate him joining us. Of course, jo- uh, racing in the Glass City 200 last week for Anthony Campy Racing. Still have plenty to come here on Coast to Coast. We've got the calendar, plus some news and notes, including another young phenom making his debut in the NASCAR National Series this weekend. We'll talk about Corey Day coming up next here on Coast to Coast. Wheelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights, white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers and warning systems for the automotive, aviation and mass notification industries worldwide. Wheelan products are designed, sourced and manufactured in America and tested on site to meet the toughest industry standards. Wheelan Engineering, manufactured in America for over 70 years. We never left and we're here to stay. Welcome back to NASCAR Coast to Coast, brought to you by Wheel and Engineering. Of course, sitting here with Rob Blount. Rob, great conversation with Matt Tipp. I want to get to some news and notes this week, and we were talking about it before the show even started. Coming up this week at Bristol, actually as this show airs Thursday, so tonight, Corey Day... Sprint car phenom, of course, picked up his second Gold Cup race at Champions at Silver Dollar a couple weeks ago. He's making his Truck Series debut with HendrickCars.com sponsorship and, of course, with McAnally Hilgeman Racing in that Chevrolet. As a pavement guy, you work with a lot of the dirt folks at, at Flow Racing. There is a lot of hype behind Corey Day. We talk about Connor Zillich. There's a lot, a lot of hype behind Corey. There certainly is. I think there was even before Kyle Larson went out and said that Corey Day is better than I was at his age. But ever since Kyle Larson, uh, who is one to make bold statements, sure. uh, went out there and said that, there has certainly been a lot of hype behind him. And he has lived up to it on the high limit racing side. I think uh, he's up to what? seven wins now seven or eight including wins including the gold cup correct so, uh he is he is definitely performing very very well um he's run he ran really strong before unfortunately crashing at salem in his arca debut back at the end of july so th- th- thursday night's gonna be really interesting he runs double duty uh running the arca start uh with the what is it the bushes beans 150 i believe it yeah. is uh and then making his truck series debut that night and it's gonna be really interesting to watch him especially transition into the truck and he's got a few more of those after bristol too that's right they inked four total races so it begins at bristol he's got kansas homestead and martinsville as well and you're right it is going to be a huge learning curve he did ha- he does have a late model win he won a hickory uh in one of their twin uh, twin feature events earlier this year but other than that it's been relatively short and sweet on the pavement side so big he's learning really curve. getting thrown into the deep end <laughs> yes but you know what sometimes that's how you got to learn these days with with all this young talent coming in so best of luck to Corey, and of course you can hear both the 
uh, Arca Menard Series, Bush Beans 200, and the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series from Bristol on tonight's uh, broadcast, again, beginning at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. All right, and the other thing, too, we were going to talk about, we were supposed to have a smart modified tour race uh, coming up at uh, Lonesome Pine this weekend, or this week, I should say. Got rained out, unfortunately, but what I thought was cool, we talked a little bit about it as well, is the Smart 3 Playoff. We've seen this now for a little bit, but a new change is we're finally going to have an actual mono e mono well mono e mono e mono three-way uh driver yeah. championship coming up at the end of the year it's the top five and we're going to narrow it down from five to three for the championship race so how is this all going to work well it's going to work pretty similar to how we see it work on the cup side right so but now there was supposed to be two races leading into uh the fi- the finale uh which is at north wilkesboro on october 19th it was supposed to be this week, uh, actually Wednesday night at Lonesome Pine, uh, and then South Boston Speedway. And the top three after those two races was going to be who went to North Wilkesboro. Now, it's only one race. Five drivers, going to eliminate two of them after South Boston. Three guys, whoever finishes the highest at North Wilkesboro Speedway on October 19th, there's your champion. And if I'm Carson Lofton, I'm probably happy that I made <laughs> my uh, my NASCAR Wheel of Modified Tour debut at North Wilkesboro Speedway. Yes albeit on the old pavement last year, because at least he has some experience at North Wilkesboro because he has had one heck of a season and has dominated the points all year long, and that's all going to go away once he goes to North Wilkesboro. Who do you think are your other two that'll be at North Wilkesboro? Obviously, we've had the success of Luke Baldwin. We talked about him winning last week. Ryan Newman could be somebody as well. Throw his name in there. I mean, who, who do you have your eyes on? Luke Baldwin, for sure. Uh, because of the fact that originally this second to last race, the penultimate race was supposed to be at Little Rock yeah. at Rockingham on the quarter mile back there. That got changed. The track wasn't ready just yet as they're focusing on getting ready for the NASCAR trucks and Xfinity weekend next year. Now it's at South Boston. Well, guess what? The last time the smart mods were at South Boston, Luke Baldwin was crowned the king of the modifieds back in yep. April. So of all places for them to go, that's a great spot for Luke Baldwin. He runs really well on high grip, high speed tracks. Just won a Dominion last weekend. Uh, and I'm going to go with the defending series champion, Burt Myers, just because experience matters for a lot. It does, for sure. And you got to have that experience when we go playoff racing. So interesting stuff. The Smart 3, again, going to be now two races beginning at South Boston Speedway. All right, coming up on the calendar this week, we've got a host of events and, of course, local short track racing all over the country. But we're going to start with our Motor Racing Network coverage of the Bushes Beans 200 at the uh, for the Arca Menard Series and Arca East at Bristol Motor Speedway. And that broadcast tonight at 5 p.m., we've got an MRN crew headed that way. Connor Zilich trying to go for his first Arca East Championship, 12-point lead over William Swalich. I'm assuming those two are going to be nip and tuck at the front of the field, but uh, do you like Connor getting the championship, or do you think it'll be uh, William Swalich maybe sneaking in there, maybe something happening? I'll, I'll stick with Connor Zilich for this one. I think he's got enough of a buffer that yeah. that's going to be all it takes. Um, Although Sawalish went out there and won this race last year before winning championships, so who knows. But I'm going to stick with Connor Zilich. That's right, and he's won four of the seven ARCA East races this year. And those two, and, and there's been some bad blood uh, over the course of the year, some run-ins, I should say. Of course, uh, uh, nobody can re- uh, forget Iowa Speedway. I actually talked to Connor, and he said, I've, I've reached out. We're trying to put the kibosh on this because <laughs> they're going to be racing each other for many years to come yeah. at the national level. So uh, it's going to be interesting championship battle. Of course, other notables, Corey Day, we mentioned, is going to be in the field. Marco Andretti doing double duty. Gio Ruggiero, of course, back with Venturini Motorsports. Dean Thompson doing double duty. And, of course, Cars Tour winner Landon Lewis is going to have an opportunity as well. So there are certainly some names that could go up there and spoil the party. Yeah, especially I was impressed when I was looking back at this that Landon Lewis was running third before he Mm -hmm. blew a right front late in that race last year. So uh, it's not like uh, he's going into this uh, not knowing how to get around Bristol. He was running pretty well last year. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's he's up there again, but still probably playing third fiddle behind Swalish and Zillish. And especially last year, too. You look at what Andres Perez did, finishing on the podium as well, and he's still looking for his first win. We talked about that. So your ARCA national leader by 54 points, seeking still his first win. Again, that race, 5 p.m. Eastern on uh, tonight on the Motor Racing Network. NASCAR with a modified tour, Winchester Fair, presented by USNE at Monadnock Speedway. Again, that's going to be 6 o'clock Eastern on Flow Racing on Saturday night. Austin Beers got the uh, pole. Trevor Catalano, of course, claimed the victory Obviously, experience matters there, but again, when you look at the championship, I'm assuming Ron Silk is going to be a favorite as well as J- uh, Justin Bonsignor. Yeah, you have to go with those two, especially late in the, in the year. Um, but who knows? Because honestly, since they repaved this track or at, before this season, it's been wide open. And the guys that have usually been good there, a.k.a. Justin Bonsignor, 
Uh, hasn't gotten a win there since. It's Jake Johnson and Trevor Catalano, two yeah. surprise winners to, at both races this year. So maybe we'll get a third surprise winner at Monadnock this weekend. We'll see what happens again. Right now, one point between your top two. so Or five points. Five, five points, points between your top two. One point on the Cars Tour. There's so many tight points championships. <laughs> it's so hard to keep, keep track of remembering them. But it's going to be good stuff again Saturday from Monadnock Speedway with their championship starting to uh, wind down. And then some other events I've got noted. The Pro All-Star Series Super Late Models with ACT at White Mountain this weekend. Stafford, Kyle Ricky's home track is going to run on Friday, but unfortunately, Kyle will be... Actually, I think he'll make it back uh, from Bristol in time to be there. Riverhead is running as well. If you're a dirt fan, the Eldoric Four Crown Nationals, one of my favorite events to watch. Uh, that'll be on Flow Racing as well, Friday and Saturday. And then I want to talk to you quickly about the NASCAR Canada Series. Boy, do they have a championship battle coming down to the wire. Autodrome Montmagny... How do you say that? Montmagny? Montmagny? Something along those lines. Montmagny. I didn't uh, study French. Me neither. My wife knows a little French. That's about it. I don't even know if she'll know how to say this. But anyways, <laughs> all 12 races this season have been lockstep. We've got, you know, five-time winner Mark on Mark Antoine, or excuse me, Kevin Lacroix going at it with Mark Antoine Cameron, who's got four wins and nine top fives. I mean, it's a 20 points, and that's, a, and that's nothing in the NASCAR Canada Series. That's several positions. So when you look at it, you have a favorite. Does Mark Antoine Cameron hang on? Kevin Lacroix is there, and also Andrew Ranger with his three wins is only two back of those two. I, I think Mark Antoine Cameron finds a way to repeat his champion this year, but honestly, who knows? Because if there's one thing that the NASCAR Canada Series knows what to, how to do, it's throw down. Oh, yeah. uh, they are good at that seemingly every single week, whether they're on dirt, a street course, a road course, or a short track paved oval. It doesn't matter. They're going to put on a show, and it's going to be full contact stock car racing. And that's why, honestly... All of us at Flow Racing, we didn't know what to expect when that came in as part of our NASCAR yeah. regional contract, and we have all fallen in love with the NASCAR Canada Series over the last couple of years, and it is the most underrated form of motorsports in North America right now. And Ky somewhere Kyle Ricky, who's unable to join us this week, is clapping because he has been a, uh, a super big supporter of the NASCAR Canada Series, was pumped to see it get on flow because now we can watch every single race, and we hope you watch Sunday for the NASCAR Canada Series Championship finale, and we'll see uh, who is crowned champion. Maybe we'll get him on the show next week, so good stuff. Before we let you go, Rob, by the way, great job this week. Do you have a driver of the week for us? I already, and as the guest, I, I'd like you to go first. I know who mine is, and we probably are going to align on this one, but I'd be curious who you have. Uh, I, I went with two, um, and That's I think one of them. That's not fair. I'm so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the other one, because I think I know who yours is going to uh -huh. be. So I'm going to say Ron Silk, uh, coming off of his season sweep at Riverhead, uh, coming into Riverhead at a points deficit, leaving there with the points lead. Um, again, this is a track that, for, he's been on the NASCAR World Modified Tour for quite a few years at this point, and he didn't get his first win there until last year. And now he's won three of the last four, including sweeping this year. He's really figured that place out. Uh, and at that stage in your career, to continue to learn as much as he has about how to get around a place like that, it's just really impressive to me. So I'll give it to him this week. I appreciate you teeing this one up for me, but I'm going to go Connor <laughs> Zillish. Uh, I mean, obviously what he's been able to do this year has been phenomenal, and it's been a pleasure of mine to not only have been in victory lane for the Motor Racing Network when he captured his first Xfinity win this past weekend, but to be on the IMSA side of things and watch him win a Rolex 24 and Sebring 12-hour, those are no small feats by any means, and those are two of the toughest races in sports car racing to win, and he did it at 17 years old back in January and in March. So I think when you look at the full body of work this year, it's been Connor Zillish, but then obviously what he did this past weekend um, and, and he's so humble. I don't think he realizes the magnitude of what he's doing just yet. He's just kind of what's the next race? You know, tell me where yep. I need to be and, and I'll go out and win. So I don't think he's done winning this year either. So we'll see what happens no. coming up tonight. Yeah, that's been Bristol. my absolute favorite thing of working with him on the car store side too, is just yeah. he's the most easygoing oh, yeah. person. Like he's arguably been the most talked about person in North American motorsports since February. And you wouldn't know when you're talking to him, but he was my other choice. I'll even show on here. <laughs> Connor Zillish is the obvious choice. So, yeah. He is, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and speaking of that, too, this weekend, he was surprised he had a line for the autographs at the merch trailer. I was like, come on, dude. <laughs> People know who you are. He's like, oh, I thought everybody was going to be lined for Justin Allgaier and everybody. But he was he had probably the biggest line out of them all. So, kudos to you, Connor. So, congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Uh, don't forget MRN on the air this weekend. We talked about it a few times, 5 p.m. Eastern tonight as this show airs on Thursday. will be the Bush's Baked Beans 200 for the Arca Menard Series and Arca East Championship 
finale at Bristol, and then immediately following 7.30-ish airtime on MRN will be the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series playoff race at Bristol, the UNOH 200, presented by Ohio Logistics. Of course, Kyle Ricky, Dylan Welch will be in the booth, and the MRN crew ready to bring you that call. I'm excited to listen as I make my way to Indianapolis for IMSA weekend. Connor is actually doing the double, the triple, if you think That's about true. it. That's true. Arca and Trucks Thursday, then he's going right to Indianapolis to practice for the LMP2 class at the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship in Indianapolis. So he's going to be a busy guy. But uh, Rob, appreciate you coming on the show, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing this with us. Always appreciate you guys having me on. It's an absolute pleasure, and uh, I'll do it as much as you guys need me. Absolutely. We'll look forward to having you back as we crown champions. This has been another edition of NASCAR Coast to Coast. want to thank Matt Tift, our special guest. Of course, our producer, Pat Jaggers. My name is Chris Wilner. Thanks for tuning in. And this episode brought to you by Wheelan Engineering, manufactured in America for over 70 years. Wheelan Engineering, of course, we will talk about it all NASCAR regional style next week on Coast to Coast.